Okay, um, it's my pleasure to not only chair the session, but also give the second talk. Um, so the title is very broad, Glycomics of Cancer and Autoimmune Diseases. So if uh, allowed me to prepare the slides only last minute. Um, we are in Leiden at the Medical Center. So um, obviously my team is focusing on, on medical uh, aspects of glycosylation. Um, the first part I want to start with is uh, working on model systems. I mean, we do a lot of glycosylation analysis from biofluids, biological samples. Recently, we moved more into analyzing cell lines. Very nice and simple systems. You just can culture them for ages. You can intervene. So I like them very much. But a basic question which you should ask and which we ask ourselves is, to which extent do these cell lines represent the situation in a human cancer setting. So you have the tumor with a certain glycosylation phenotype, which is important for interaction with the immune cells. Does now the cell line have a similar glycosylation? And we did this for colorectal cancer. Um, we have published on um, end glycosylation of the tumor tissue and of cell lines, and there we found quite a good um, agreement in the overall glycosylation repertoire. We now do, th do this also for the oglycans, which are certainly functionally very important in immune suppression uh, in cancer. And these are just two examples of colorectal cancer cell lines. Um, and you see that they are, if you look at the O-glycome analyzed by PGC, negative ion mode, um, analyzing the alditols, which were chemically released, you see they are very, very diverse. So we, for one cell line, the upper one, you see a high level of, sil of fucosylation also, and the lower one, is virtually devoid of, uh, of fucosis. So very diverse uh, types of glycans on these cell lines. I want to go more in detail on this. So if you now just look at one composition, and we saw that from the talk of, of Sabine, you have a composition and then you can ask yourself, what is the underlying structure? So in this case, we have one composition, we look in two cell lines and we see very diverse types of glycans. Here we have more uh, silent Lewis type or Lewis type uh, structures and here we have more blood type uh, structures expressed on these oak lichens. So we already see uh, from these two examples oak glycosylation in colorectal cancer cell lines is very diverse. Of course we didn't stop with the two cell lines, we did 25 um, and we used a rigorous approach for structural analysis of all these uh, peaks, mass spec, tandem mass spec in negative ion mode. We looked at the migration position in this uh, chromatographic uh, method. We used exoglycosidases. And from that, this is just a summary of the major glycosylation features we found. Uh, we, found we looked at Lewis type uh, terminal motifs, at blood type uh, motifs, at branching of these oak lichens, core types. Um, and then we tried to link the knowledge we had on, the, on these colorectal cancer cell lines. How do they behave? What is their um, growth pattern? What is their uh, differentiation status? We try to link that to the glycomic signatures. Certainly no perfect match, but here the upper ones are differentiated. So these are, have an epithelial differenti differentiation type. And here these cell lines uh, are described as being less or non-differentiated. So do you find any clear associations? Um, so I will look into that in more detail. But what we also said is uh, what we for sure expect is that the transcriptomic makeup of the cell should be reflected in the glycosylation. So um, like what, what Yuri talked about, glycosylation is regulated. It's, it's influenced by genes, by gene expression. That's what we uh, try to see here. So we looked into um, glycogenes, but also known uh, transcription factors, which are important in colon differentiation. And then we see that for these different cell lines in a volcano blot, we have a whole bunch of transcription factors which are differentially uh, expressed with a differentiation status of the cell. And also glycogenes are differentially expressed. And now what we did is we looked how does the transcriptomic level associate with the glycosylation status which we measured. And that's here. So we did a correlation map. We put in the glycogenes. We also put in the transcription, uh, the transcription factors and here uh, the glycosylation which we measured. And we see, for example, that some glycosylation 
some transcription factors like CDX1 have a vast influence on glycosylation, so they um, stimulate the, the, they increase the fucosylation. So we have the solid Lewis type of structures, the fucosyl transferases, and all of that are going uh, up with high CDX1 expression. Um, also, uh, blood groups are going up, so we see a whole lot of, of changes in glycosylation. And the most important message from this is actually not what we see, but that we see it. So we have 25 cell lines. They are, of course, the genetic background is very diverse. It's all from different persons, but still you get quite good correlations here. 0.7 uh, uh, are the correlation coefficients, the maximum which we find. So quite a good correlation between the O-glycosylation phenotype and the transcriptomic levels of transcription factors and glycogenes. So, in a way, transcriptomics can be linked uh, to the phenotype of the cell. Now, um, I will now move into another methodology or a whole suite of methods which we have developed in our group uh, since 2013-14. So, uh, we focus a lot on salic acids, which are the terminal motifs, and a bunch of the talks previously already were about salic acids, and uh, they are involvement in binding and in differentiation. So uh, what we do here is we differentiate chemically the 2,3 and the 2,6 linked salic acids. We do that by a derivatization reaction and we um, make from these isomeric structures, structures with different masses. So that's very convenient if you want to do mass spec and differentiate them. And I will now show how this chemistry can be used uh, for a ultra high sensitivity detection of those salylated glycans. For that we use uh, a CE separation of the glycans which we release, uh, release by PNGSF. We put a tag on the glycans but we also stabilize the, the salic acid by this chemistry. So a key aspect here is also that we, um, that we neutralize uh, the, the salic acids. This is a capillary electrophoresis so all of you know electrophoresis. It's a charge separation but actually uh, we were not interested in separating monosalylated from di from triacylylated uh, glycans because that we already can get from mass spec. So we said we want to keep them together, but rather within uh, the, the, the glycans have a isomer separation which we can't achieve by our mass spec uh, derivatization technique. So we were happy to neutralize all the salic acids by this chemistry and then only put a single positive charge on the reducing end. Uh, sorry, and by that uh, get a separation, as I said, where we keep all the glycans quite closely together and then can try to separate them, the isomers. Um, the key aspect here, though, was uh, the sensitivity. So here we, uh, the, the key message here is, is this small thingy here, kind of a, a few atomoles are enough for us um, if we put them in to detect these glycans. And this is important because we very often you don't only want to do glycomics, you also want to do proteomics, you want to do metabolomics, so you want to integrate various types of omics, and that means we also have to be at the same sensitivity level as uh, proteomics, which we achieve by this methodology. Um, now, this is about sensitivity, then what can we detect? We use the plasma glycans, where we have plenty of, I have to admit, but we just use that as a model system. And you see we, can, we have a vast dynamic range, so we can me measure the major plasma glycan species. Uh, we, these here are a factor of 10 lower in abundance. Here we are a factor of 100 lower, so we really also can dig into the minor species in the plasma glycome. We were able to detect 167 compositions, um, quantify quite a bunch of them, and what we are now doing is we are improving the separation. So we are now pulling all these species apart and we get very often two or three isomers which we can separate. And we are now busy analyzing and assessing the structures of all those isomers. So for us, this is a, a method which is, has, comes with higher sensitivity as compared to the PGC method. It's a factor of roughly 100, which we are more sensitive. Okay, just published in Nature Communications. Then um, I move now into, um, into mass spectrometry imaging very shortly, because uh, Rick will talk about that uh, later. 
so I'll keep it short. This is the general workflow. You have a tissue slide. Uh, you prepare your analyte from there to you apply matrix and then you measure. Each pixel is one mass spectrum. What we do is we do this together with pathologists. So they assign, uh, in this case, a, a tumor um, section. They assign the different regions there. And then we can define the glycomic signature of all these different tissue regions. Um, again, we use this salic acid deratization uh, suit. Uh, to get the salic acids stable and to be able to differentiate them, uh, the different linkages on the tissue. Now, here you get the, uh, we can zoom in on a specific mass and look where those glycans are distributed on the tissue. And of course, we then link it to the information obtained from the pathologist. So then you see that some um, collagen rich regions here, so um, let's say, uh, yeah, these are fibroblasts, so those regions come with a certain glycosylation signature. And if we now look at the differential expression of 2,3 and 2,6 linked salic acids, we see that um, the 2,3 the linked has a very distinct expression profile from the 2,6 linked. So certain cell types and regions have a very specific glycosylation uh, feature. We, um, yeah. What we are now doing is we have 16 tissues from 16 different patients and we try to get signatures which are also predictive for patient outcome. So hopefully the pathologists can use this in the future. Now, just another example on, um, on how we use mass spec imaging um, of glycans. In this case, without uh, linkage uh, specific dermatization. What we did here is it's a mixoid liposarcoma. We have a clinician, a pathologist who works on this. Here you see the tumor in a section of, of, the, of the leg. It's huge. And uh, these are now tissue microarrays, so only tiny small pieces of tissue from different patients. And there you can look at the, at the histology. Uh, this is a mild uh, phenotype with uh, low cellularity, and if you get more cells, it comes with a, with a worse prognosis for this patient. And what we found is now that uh, certain types of glycans, certainly these oligomanocytic glycans, they are more abundant in the, in the, in the uh, more severe, severely affected tissues. So this is a uh, bad prognosis tissue, and those come with a, with a high level of oligomanocytic glycans. We also looked at the uh, prediction, and this is actually the best predictor we have until now for a uh, for bad outcome. So if you look at, you, you, the pathologist looks at what is the bad region on, on, in the tumor. If we then look at the, at the abundance of the oligomanocytics in that region, that's, that, that's a bad predictor for, or it's a good predictor for a bad outcome, I should say. Good. And I mean, this is not, not a surprise. So um, oligomanocytic glycans have been shown to be high in cancer uh, in many publications already. These are two papers from Nikki Packer and co collaborators, another paper. So very often you see that in, in cancer, the high menos glycans are increased also in this case. So this seems to be a, a, rougher, a rather common feature of cancer. High menos um, also associates with bad outcome. Good. Now, uh, these are two other fields where we use um, this deratization suit. In this case, uh, we use it to measure glycopeptides, not by LCMS as we would normally do, but in this case by MOLDI after this uh, deratization. I will not talk on this further, but I will talk on the end glycan analysis. So, um, I now presented the PGC workflow uh, where we can use analyze end glycans, O glycans, glycolipid glycans um, in depth. Then I showed you the CE workflow, which is maybe even more tedious, where we can do it at very high sensitivity. Now I will show you a high throughput method where we can analyze hundreds of uh, glycan species, but we get less information, I have to admit. This is the workflow. We do it on a robot. We release the glycans to the chemistry, do a cleanup. We spot the glycans on a multi-target plate, and then we get a mass spectrum where we can again differentiate all these isomers, like here, two six-linked salic acid, two three-linked salic acid. Um, so we can quantify 100 glycans roughly from such a plasma sample. 
and then look at the C signatures, for example. Um, this is something which uh, Victoria Dodds uh, here in the audience uh, recently assembled. So, uh, so what are we actually measuring? We're looking at different uh, glycan groups or classes. We uh, then in these classes have specific glycan structures and based on literature we can link this uh, to specific proteins. Not 100% not but we can assume that these glycans are largely present on apolipoprotein B100. These here are on IgG, here this glycan is on IgA. So although we release the glycans and don't measure them on, on a protein-specific manner, we can still make some assumptions that these glycans, if they change, might reflect a change in the glycosylation of that protein. Good. Now, uh, just a very rough and short summary on how this um, occurs in different diseases. So, colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, type 2 diabetes. We have uh, done studies and published studies on this together with Gordon, with other collaborators. And, uh, of course, it's getting interesting then to, to look how what are the differences and the commonalities in, uh, between all these dif diseases. And this is very schematically indicated here by arrows. So some glycans are going up, others are going down. And you see already that there are quite some differences between these disease phenotypes. I will back, come back uh, to this later, a few slides later. Now, we did not only do these four diseases, we recently looked into pancreatic cancer. Why this? I mean, pancreatic, pancreatic cancer is often detected very late. So there's really an urgent need for an early detection marker. And uh, the first thing we did is uh, looking into a signature of this disease, and that's shown here. So we compared healthy persons with, a, with a patients upon diagnosis. And, um, and then you try to differentiate patients from controls, and you look at the area under the curve for all these glycans. We actually included these three glycans in building a model, and then we get 0 0.87, 0 0.81 um, as a area under the curve, which is very decent, I would say. Um, what I also would like to stress, here we had a very old cohort from, the, from 2004, and the other cohort was from 2016, so very different uh, times of, of collection, and still you can use the model built on the one uh, and replicate it on, on the other cohort. So we have a rather strong signature of pancreatic cancer. Um, how do we, how we can we use this now? You can look whether this can be uh, useful for prognosis. That's not the first uh, and most important aspect because prognosis is anyhow very bad for pancreatic cancer. So the second aspect is more important. There are people who have mutations and are at high risk of developing uh, pancreatic cancer. And those should be monitored and uh, followed up. So what we want to do is have a longitudinal setup. And actually, we are just measuring these data now. If you follow these high-risk persons, do you then see a change or a shift of their glycomic profile, to, profile to, towards a cancer profile? And that could hopefully be useful to pick up pancreatic cancer earlier than it's now and hopefully give a better prognosis for the patient. Um, I mean, one thing is that you get a signature. The other is, if we ha would have a signature, how can we use that? And for that, we look into dried blood uh, spots. So not drawing a whole, a whole vial of, of blood, but rather uh, drawing uh, small amounts, just a finger uh, from the fingertip. And there we see that we can measure those glycomic signatures just from whole blood, from a, uh, from a filter paper. Uh, we also looked whether this is a, a robust method and uh, we can store these filter papers with a droplet of blood for a couple of weeks at room temperature and this does not uh, change the profile. So I think this gives a perspective that we can uh, measure these glycomic signatures um, and you can um, maybe draw the blood at home yourself or uh, at the GP very in, a, in a very easy manner and, that, uh, and then hopefully people can be followed up every six months, every year, and uh, we can pick up uh, disease signatures. So similar to the glycan age, uh, which uh, Gordon is promoting and selling. Now, I promised you to come back on to the disease signatures. Uh, so here we have uh, disease signatures now for different glycan traits. 
and red means up in disease, blue means down in disease. Uh, and here you also see that BMI, age, and sex also have a massive influence on these glycomic signatures, you know. And that is one of the reasons why it really makes sense to follow one person. So you would say, okay, you have these skewings of your profile due to age, sex, and disease, but on top you may now develop a UC signature or a CD signature. So that is a way we uh, envision that this could be used for longitudinal analysis in patients. Now, finally, the last uh, small part of my talk is on glycoproteomics. Until now, we released glycan, so we lost all the information on uh, where is the glycan, on, on which protein, on which site. We do this also in a site-specific manner for IgG and for IgA, for example, where you have a bunch of different uh, glycans. For IgA1, you also have hinge region O glycans. How do we do this? So it simply means we do an affinity purification of the antibodies, IgG, IgA, we cut them by uh, trypsin, we measure the glycopeptides by LCMS, and for this we have a fast method, so we can do this in, uh, within 30 minutes, we can do an analysis, and then you get clusters. So here you see one glycosylation site, another, another, and you can then look at the profile, just looking at the spectrum for this region of the chromatogram, it gives you the glycoprofile of that site. And we can do this now also for IgA. Um, so this is an n glycosylation profile of one of the sites of IgA. And we can also look at the O-glycosylation of IgA in its hinge region. And this is important in IgA nephropathy, for example. So we are quite excited about that, that we don't stick with IgG for the rest of our life, but expand this. And uh, so now we, we did a, a bigger cohort where we now can hopefully look also at uh, associations with a genetic sn uh, with a SNPs. So how, is, how do genes influence IgA O-glycosylation or O-glycosylation in general? We can look at uh, diseases like in nephropathy, what is the glycomic signature there? Um, we found a very strong signature of IgA glycosylation of colorectal cancer. So what we expected, just having a blurred view of all glycans from all proteins gives okayish signals, but if you look at one specific protein, this can be way stronger. And we also look into IBD. So, um, and I think moving in this direction towards specific proteins uh, will be quite strong and important. Conclusions. So, one is that I think uh, cell lines are quite useful uh, model organisms, uh, model systems, I should say, for many glycobiological questions. You have to characterize them, though. The toolbox is very useful for high sensitivity analysis of glycans and also mass spec uh, imaging, so the salic acid derivatization toolbox, which I showed. Um, these oligomanocytic end glycans are a uh, good uh, predictor for outcome in patients uh, with a myxoid liposarcoma. And we now have these signatures of pancreatic cancer, which we will evaluate for following up these high risk patients. Um, then the dried blood spots, I think that's important in an investment into the future. So hopefully any signatures we have can be then used for in a clinical setting. Um, we looked at these uh, glycomic signatures of many diseases and we see they are quite different. So it's not like any inflammatory disease will drive your glycosylation in the very same direction. So then an important direction is going for specific proteins, not releasing all glycans from all proteins. And currently we have a focus on IgA there, but AAT, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, I mean, major plasma proteins are in our focus. And then finally, I think uh, clinical glycomics should work with a longitudinal uh, follow-up. So you saw age, sex, BMI, many uh, influences are there on the glycome. Um, if you can uh, measure minor changes which are disease associated um, in the longitudinal setting, I think that's the way to go. I would like to acknowledge people from the group who did the work actually. So, Nortia and Victoria are in, in the audience, um, the others not. And uh, this is the photo from our last lab outing. We collaborate with Genos a lot and also with the clinicians at our hospital. Thanks. <laughs>